everyone, I'm Stephanie, and this is the Italian American Stories Podcast. So today's story is about Antonio Clevio Massimo Sabatino, and he was an Italian American who was known for his great strength, vaudeville acrobatic performances, wrestling battles, music talent, and being the personal trainer slash bodyguard to Teddy Roosevelt, and honestly, so much more. But because of the topic of today's episode, I have a special guest host joining me today, my wonderful husband, Jared. Hey, what's up, boo-boo? Hi, love. Calls me (laughs) (laughs) boo-boo. And so um, mom has the day off today, and Jared's joining. And like I said, he's going to join because of this topic. So Jared is loves bodybuilding, strongman competitions, he competes in all of that, and that's what our Clevio is all about. Yeah, I mean, this is going to be a pretty interesting topic for me, because, um, you know, I've been into this my whole life, really. Yep. So, yeah, and I grew up hearing stories about my uncles, who were who were professional wrestlers back in the day. Exactly. So. Yeah, and we'll talk. I want. I have a part where I want to talk about your uncles a little bit. Yeah. Um. Because Clevio was a professional wrestler too. So. Yeah. Yep. It's pretty cool. So it should be fun. All right. All righty. Let's get into this. And mom will be back next episode. <laughs> yeah. You wore her out. You had her clean our whole house. You know, she, <laughs> she needs a rest day. She's been cooking and cleaning and podcasting. <laughs> she just never stops ever. But that's an Italian mama for you right there. Yep. <laughs> Well, let's dive on into Clevio Massimo's story. To start off, he's got quite the name, Antonio Clevio Massimo Sabatino, (laughs) but he went by Clevio Massimo on stage and honestly at times in real life. So for the rest of the episode, we're just going to refer to him as Clevio. Make it a little easier. Yeah, I like that. (laughs) It's quite the name. Uh, all right. So Clevio was born on May 4th, 1890. May the 4th be with you. I knew that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> all the all the Star Wars fans out there are going to really like this guy. They are going to love that. As I was writing the script and I wrote May 4th, I was like, oh, I know. <laughs> I don't even have to tell Jared what to say here. He's just going to put it in there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah. So he was born May 4th, 1890 in Abruzzo, Italy. And his parents were Antonio Sabatino and Cecita Muscati, which reminds me of Moscato wine. <laughs> Your favorite? My favorite. Um, and they came to, and so he came to America in 1895 with his parents and the family, they settled in Buffalo, New York, and he was one of nine children and he was actually the oldest child. So he kind of had the extra responsibility there. And so during his childhood, his parents really pushed him to become a musician, a musician, or at least dabble in the music world. And they ended up buying him a violin. So now Clevio, he practiced and actually became a pretty talented violinist. But when he was younger, he was really more focused, was more focusing his ambitions on his physical strength and becoming a wrestler. Yeah, I thought that was cool because uh, I tried playing the viola when I was in, in yeah. middle school. That's right. I remember you telling me about that. Didn't work out too well. <laughs> <laughs> you focus more on the this physical guy, I mean, he... he, he, he he was a good violinist. He was. Yeah, so that's amazing that, uh, that's cool that his parents got him into that at a young age. So. I think so too. And, you know, there's a lot of research out there that talks about how um, music can really help a kid become a better mathematician, help him, you know, just overall in school as well too. So it's kind of cool. Yeah, I, I can see that because they, they got to learn the, like, composition, how to read music and exactly you know, yeah i could see that and it kind of i think works a brain in a different way than what a tra- you know just a traditional classroom would work your brain so having that musical practice kind of helps too so if you're hearing background noise that's me slurping down my starbucks <laughs> we got an early starbucks this because <laughs> it's pretty early here in colorado it's seven o'clock in, on a saturday so <laughs> we are cruising we are early birds we are early birds definitely all right, so... Bed at 7, 7 p.m. <laughs> Glass <laughs> of warm milk. <laughs> bed at, go to bed at 7, up at 4. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're not that old, but you know, we do like to go to bed early. All right, so... Um, how, okay, so we were talking about, you know, his, he uh, practiced the violin, um, but he was focusing a little bit more as a younger lad on his physical strength. Um, but however, he did end up later on in life combining these two talents 
when he was older and he performed on stage showing off his great strengths. So he would begin or sometimes end his strength performances by playing the violin, which I think if you kind of look at this time frame, that was probably really good for his audience because, you know, bodybuilding and strength competitions are very popular now, but early 1900s, it was probably a small niche of people. But adding that violin probably drew extra people in. Yeah, no, I I agree with that. I mean, honestly, a lot of people view, especially bodybuilding, as uh, odd, kind of. People really still don't understand it. Yeah. And uh, think of, you know... It's kind of like a vain thing to do. Yeah. So I would imagine back then that uh, being in the early 1900s, you know, people were working hard and they didn't have a whole lot of leisure time, no. especially to work on their bodies. So exactly. they might have thought that was quite odd. Was so odd. that was probably a good decision on his part. So. No, I agree. <sighs> well, and a lot of the jobs were so laborious yeah. then that they were you know, constantly working their bodies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're exhausted working in the mines or factories or something. Yeah. Um, and, you know, a lot of the bodybuilding and strength that was back then associated with circus and, quote, freak shows. Like, they always had a strong man in yeah. the, those kind of things. The spectacle. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. and, uh, I mean, you know, I watch a lot of strong men. And, uh, yeah, like, one of my favorite guys I follow is Brian Shaw. Strong, Colorado guy. Four-time world's strongest man. But um, there's a show, That Strongest Man in History, on the History Channel. Oh, yeah. And uh, I've heard that they're going to do a second season of that. Oh, nice. And I was thinking, man, they should, one, of the, they, one of them should do this guy. Clevio. So if everybody hasn't seen that, um, it's Brian Shaw, Nick Best, and Robert Oberst, and Eddie Hall. Yeah. And uh, they're all, they, well, oh, it's, a good amount of them are retired now. Well, actually, they're all retired now. Yeah, all four oh, yeah. of them are retired because now. Because Brian Shaw is retired. Ryan Shaw was the last one yeah. to retire. So, but anyways, they pick strong men from history and they reenact some of their feats of strength. So that's right. I kind of remember watching that, like something with like lifting a coin machine and yeah, like odd lifting. And we'll actually talk about odd lifting here. That in a was bit. Paul Anderson. Okay, Paul Anderson. It was a, a the silver dollar deadlift. That's right. Yeah, so, you know, they were reenacting some of these feats of strength. But this would be cool because uh, this guy has got a wonderful story. Oh, he does. And, like, we'll get into a lot of some of the stuff that he does. But, I mean, he does, like, lifting a piano and doing these, like, putting stuff around his neck. And so they that would be a cool thing if they reenacted some of his stuff. Yeah. That'd be really cool. Yeah, we might have to uh, shoot him a message yeah. with uh and they're really personable too because uh i was part of their uh it was like you can join brian shaw's it's like a membership yeah so if anybody's interested out there they just take a look at that um uh, they they provide a lot of different stuff as part of the membership but um but his wife was really nice yeah and she was sending me emails making sure that you know, everything was set up right and all that type of stuff. So, Which is really cool, too, because <clears throat> Brian Shaw's a pretty big time in his industry. Yeah, he to is. To have it still feel like kind of that small, like, hey, you know, we'll help you out sort of thing. Yeah, interacting. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I, I, yeah, anyways, I, and I don't want to get on a side tangent too much, no, but Brian, like a... Brian Shaw is a really down to earth guy and he tries to treat everybody just, you know, the same. You know, yeah. He's, he's, he, he's, uh, he's in a great position. But, anyways, The main part of this is, uh, I think this guy deserves some some mention. I do too. And I think he's kind of was one of those guys that slipped through the cracks of time. I agree. And people don't understand. Well, let's get in. Let let, let's get into it because I mean it it was quite surprising some of these things. So oh, me too. Because you know I just googled (laughs) you know Italian strongman and he was one of the first ones that came up and. As I was going, I was like, wow, he had an interesting life. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so in 1941, the Evening Post newspaper in Charleston, South Carolina, commented on his musical and physical performance by saying, quote, Music hath charms. Clevio Massimo, a famous strongman, was an accomplished violinist. He opened his show by playing the difficult Mendelssohn's Concerto in E minor and then would strip to his tights and perform feats of strength. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god just just that whole 
that whole thing, right? That whole scene that's paint the picture it's painting in my head right now. I, I'm trying to decide like if they were to reenact that. I mean, <laughs> it would be hilarious to see Brian do that. <laughs> but then I'm thinking like Robert Oberst and Eddie Hall would also be hilarious too. Yeah, they would. So, but I mean, anyways, I that would be that would be so cool. I think it would uh, be cool to like watch them rip off their tights and almost do like the Sebastian Maniscalco where he has like the yeah. rip away jogging pants and just like rip away the show, the pants. Well, all four of them would have to have to do it, so yep. they'd all have to get in tights and rip them bad boys off. And go to... <laughs> Maybe it would be funnier watching them try to like actually rip tights. Yeah. <laughs> oh um, man, that's so funny. I know, but that is a cool um, a cool image. You know, this guy just. Because, you know, you associate some of that classical music with more uppity, and then he's like, rah! I mean, honestly, he might be the only strong man, because I've heard a lot of stories about strong You men. have. He might be the only one who was an accomplished musician like that. How cool is that? And actually, like, would play, uh, like, he played Mendelssohn's Concerto in E minor. Yeah. Is, which is, from what I understand, a really difficult <clears throat> That's what I heard too when yeah, I was reading peace, this. So. You know, and I know bodybuilding through you, and I have always associated bodybuilding with classical music because bodybuilding now, and I'm, you know, I don't know when it started, but um, a lot of their routines were done to classical music. Yes. It almost makes you wonder: is it a tie back or to Clevio? Like, you know, do people maybe watch some of his videos or hear about him and think? bodybuilding routine to classical music or maybe classical music just flows better to bodybuilding routines yeah it's probably a little bit of both because um especially during during arnold's time they yeah. were still using classical yeah um they don't and do it has much. to do you know you can't have a like uh music that's too fast or, or, or fast tempo or like kind of thing. you know like somebody goes out there with some techno that's gonna be a <laughs> crazy bodybuilder routine yeah, that is. but yeah, like classical is really nice because it has dramatic points in it where people can really hit some dramatic poses too yeah. and it's flowy that's true so um they can hold their poses longer versus having to you yeah. know keep up with that music that makes sense yeah yep. that's pretty cool um so now it sounds like clevio he came from some pretty good strong stock because back in italy his dad and two uncles were known as the Three Giants. <laughs> and there are even rumors that his that the family comes from Roman gladiators. So he's got that, that going for him. Um, and Clevio, he talked about how his family viewed physical strength. And he said, quote, For them, might is right. Weakness is a crime, and men and women should be strong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, when I heard that, I was like, that's a pretty cool saying. It is. You know, it's just one of those quick statements that has a lot of meaning it does. to it. You yeah, know? It, exactly. It's not a really long quote, but um, because you could look at weakness as physical, mental, um, and being strong as physical and mental too. Like it has, it could have multiple meanings. So yeah. like reminds me of that movie Conan the Barbaria, Barian, when they ask Conan, what is best in life? <laughs> what is he been? He's like, crush your enemies, <laughs> see them driven before you and hear the lamentation of the women. <laughs> Do you of course, see? that last part is not, you know, what sure. Clevio was trying to get across. But yeah. it, was, it was just, it's just a strong statement. Exactly. You know? Where so. strength is a good thing. Yeah. Uh, do you see why I have Jared on this podcast now? <laughs> <laughs> this is right up his alley. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so he really started becoming interested in strength training, you know, physical strength when he was a boy living, living in Buffalo. And he was most likely inspired by popular acrobats like... Rigoletta, like the Rigoletta brothers, uh, Bell Claire brothers, and many other extremely skilled teams. And like we talked about earlier, a lot of these these groups of people, they were in like vaudeville or circus kind of things. Um, and sometimes they would come to Buffalo, but in most cases, Clevio had to travel to watch them in New York City. And so he started working to help support the family at the age of 12. Like I said earlier, he was the oldest kid. Um, but he didn't give up on his dreams. And so he still worked on pursuing them by going to the YMCA and working out, which is pretty amazing. You think of 12, like, childhoods are so different 
now from back then. I mean, he's 12, he's helping to support the family, and he's going to the YMCA. <laughs> like, no excuses <laughs> at all. <laughs> Didn't have all that time staring at a screen or yes. playing video games. You 100%. Know? It's like what kids don't know, you know? That's yeah. just the way life was. Exactly, yeah. And they were out and they were about and they were doing things. Yep, exactly. So. Had a lot more responsibility back then. Yeah. And a lot yeah. more. <laughs> yeah. I'm oh, for sure. I mean... And so, like, you know, me and you were born in the 80s. And yep. so, I mean, we were spoiled, too. Oh, you know? especially compared to this, <laughs> I mean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean. Definitely. Uh, but, I yeah, mean, I mean. I've taught 12-year-olds a few years ago. They are not doing this. <laughs> no. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's just progressively it gotten worse in that regard. Because yeah. the way the world is moving, yeah. everything is so digital. You know, exactly. I mean, shoot, you know, I work... 100% remote from home. I'm sitting at a computer all day. Yep, exactly. But, uh, you know, that's why it's good to remind yourself to get up. <laughs> get up from the computer and almost pass out because all the blood like pulls in you. <laughs> like, yeah, don't, don't pass out in your yeah, home office. That would be <laughs> That would be really bad. <laughs> it's dangerous work what I do, I'm telling you. <laughs> you have no idea the, the danger of working from home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, and so when Clevia was 17, he decided that he really wanted to pursue some type of career in physical strength. And he started working with Charles Blair, and his weightlifting career started off from this point. And at the beginning of his career, he would just perform weightlifting exercises. But the audience was not as enthusiastic as he, he was hoping, and we kind of talked about that earlier, you know, for the time frame. Um, I mean, it's 1907, so he was... Because he was born in 1890. So when he's 17, it's 1907. People are just not that familiar. Yeah, when, it, uh, when we learned about this, this immediately brought me to the issues that they still have nowadays. Mm -hmm. So if he was just going out and doing like bench press, squat, I mean, he was basically doing an exhibition of like powerlifting. True. You know, because that, that's all powerlifting is. It's, yeah. it's bench, deadlift, and squat. And uh, powerlifting is a cool sport, and uh, I know there's a lot of people into it, but it doesn't draw the crowds like strongman does. Yeah, exactly. You know, strongman always is going to have that element of a spectacle. Yes. Which I think they shouldn't lose, because that's part of its history. I agree. But at the same time, like people like Ryan Schott, they're really trying to bring it in more into the mainstream. Yeah. And make it more of like, hey... You know, just kind of like the way MMA was, the way the UFC did with the MMA. Yeah. You know, it, it didn't start off that way. It was kind of like received, re first received as oh. like, oh, they're a bunch of crazy guys beating the hell out of each other. Exactly. But now look at it. It's on ESPN. You yeah, know, it's very mainstream. The UFC has merged with the WWE. It's a huge, it's it a huge like corporation. MMA was like the redheaded stepchild of boxing back in the day because boxing had rules and regulations and, you yeah. know. What are these called? Boxing gloves? Boxing gloves, yeah. You know, and, and the yeah. name was just like, go in the ring and go for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was crazy. But sorry, I didn't mean to get off on a no, tangent no. there. But really what it is, is um, he was doing something he loved, but people weren't interested in seeing that. It wasn't exciting. It wasn't exciting. So. You know, and even, like you said, nowadays it's not even that exciting. And you think about if you're just doing, you know, a bench press or dumbbell curls or whatever, most people are at the gym, they see that all the time. You know, yeah. but having that extra flair is what draws the crowd. And, and so back then, you know, they didn't really have well, gyms. Or they had, I mean, they had some, but it wasn't something that people were really doing. No. It was people like him. Yes. There was a small group of people that were getting into weightlifting. Yeah. And like we were talking about earlier, you know, these people probably thought it was quite odd. Oh, I'm sure. And you know, why are you wasting your energy doing this when you could be using it working or, so, or something like that exactly. and they probably just didn't get it no period and i think, and I think it was just so because it was such a you know like you were saying earlier such a laborious world too people were working yeah. and then when you when you said you know wasting your time they probably had no idea the amount of food that he ate as well like that would probably be a shocker to them as well because well, for sure i know when you probably like, feed their whole family <laughs> For like three days. They're like, what is this guy doing? Because <laughs> when you're getting ready for those competitions, you're just lifting a lot. I mean, yeah. and I see, you're ravenous. This He was only like, what, 5'8", 5'9"? I think he was 5'8". Five 5'8", eight. Five eight, but very thick guy. Oh, stacked, yeah. Obviously, yeah. For sure. Yeah, because I know how much you eat, so. 
Yeah. Yeah. When you get lifting. Yeah. A lot, yeah. You get hungry. Start lifting. Your body craves those yep. nutrients and calories. And Good thing you married an Italian woman who likes to cook, huh? It is true. <laughs> I have uh, enjoyed that cooking over the years. So. That's good. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, so because, you know, his audience was not as engaged in his weightlifting performances, um, he started kind of changing his career more towards a vaudeville strongman. And like we were just talking about, that's going to have that extra flair that'll draw a, a crowd. And he actually did this for quite a few years. And his act would include things like handstands, leg and bicep curls. So right there alone, just having throwing a handstand in is going to feel different than just doing lifts, you know? Yeah. Why do, they, why do they call it vaudeville? You know what? That's a really good question. I don't know what vaudeville means. I know that it's like older theatrical performances. So it says, uh, I just looked it up on Google and why is it called vaudeville? And it comes from the Northern part of France, from the Valley called Val de Vere. And, um, so basically, vaudeville is a theat- theatrical genre of a variety of entertainment which began in France. And it was originally a comedy without psychological or moral intentions. And But it kind of slowly turned into like a feature having specialty acts such as burlesque, comedy, song, dance. And then I think it started pulling in more of the odd niches like strongman. Yeah, that's cool. So, that's... Yeah. And, and from the sounds of this, the vaudeville strongmen were more, uh, they did a lot of gymnastics. Yes. Type yeah. acrobatic mm-hmm. and gymnastic, which you would see in a circus. Exactly. Um, so a circus strongman. Yes. Right? <laughs> so much. a sideshow. So that makes sense with the way, the way they described that. The way that. they described it. Yeah, exactly. That's cool. I don't. I never even thought about where that came from, but that's kind of interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah. And how it progressed throughout the years and changed. Yeah. And now you don't. You know, you don't even hear about it anymore. No. Yeah. Um, and so he would also do things like juggling, lifting his assistant assistant into the air, and of course he would play his violin. But one of his most famous acts during his vaudeville years was having his partner or assistant do a handstand on Clevio's forearms. <laughs> yeah. And so, and I actually, I watched a YouTube video where the guy was, he kind of does like, pulls all these old straw man guys and talks about them. And he was talking about how Clevio has one of the most, like the most massive forearms he's ever seen. So, I mean, you think about a man's hand on somebody's forearm, like that's a lot of strength. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, that's uh I've heard I've heard uh, strong men talk about this before, um, and back so once again back to that what I was talking about the strongest man in history they they talk about these things yeah so um, you know that's a that's static strength I mean this guy is is holding a position and somebody else is is uh, getting on top of him Robert or Oberst and I think we later on we get in we get into this thing about the piano yes we do yeah well Robert Oberst describes it as squish weight. Because they're getting into a position and then weights being put on them. Okay. Right? So they're kind of using their structure to support the weight. Okay. Which is a little bit different than like a dynamic lift. Like if you were to like actually go through a range of motion. Yeah. So there are some differences there, but... Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, obviously it's not taking away anything from what they were doing because obviously it takes technique... Uh, you have to be strong still, exactly. especially, you know, throughout the body, the core and everything like that. So. Well, especially with the core, because so what, what Clevio would do is he would stand up and put his arms out and the other person would literally just do a hands on his forearms. So, you know, that person is shaking and yeah. moving. So you've got to have that strong core to hold yourself and your forearms still. Yeah. I mean that, and I'll post a picture of it on the Instagram page so that everybody can see it, but it's interesting it it all starts with one person one person said why don't we try this can you imagine how that went the first time and then they started figuring it out over time and they passed those techniques down right over the years they were like Claudio your forearms are so massive what could we do with those let's just do a handstand on them Um, and so he actually he worked with you know the vaudeville but he ended up performing with Barnum and Bailey Circus also and he had an act called the Modern Hercules, 
And actually, that's what I called this podcast. Uh, this episode is the Italian Hercules because he was referred to referred to as like being like Hercules a lot. So yeah, so I guess uh, Lou Ferrigno and mm-hmm. Arnold. If you don't know who this guy is, he was your OG <laughs> yes. because they both played Hercules in movies. Uh, so uh, one of them did Hercules in New York, and the other one did Her- this Her- Hercules the okay. movie. So I mean they, yeah. Uh, and this guy was actually well, Lou Ferrigno is Italian, of course, too. Yes. But, and, yeah. and then this guy's Italian. Yeah, so, exactly. So, so yeah, yeah, he was the OG. He was the first modern yeah. Hercules. Yeah. <laughs> and this act, the modern Hercules act, it was said to be really, really popular um, with the Barnum and Bailey Circus. So during his time with Barnum and Bailey, he here's where we kind of get into the piano. Uh, he would lift things like a piano, um, and oh, I'm sorry, he would lift like eight men with his legs. So he had some sort of a machine kind of thing, and he would he would push on it, and then it would lift the the eight men who were standing on the platform. And so he would lift them, and then he would hold a piano with a musician on it. And I'm curious how this looked. I couldn't find a picture of it other than like a cartoon picture where it was obviously you know he was holding the piano with one hand but it was like I said it was a cartoon picture so I'd like to see how he did that so this is interesting because once again I keep on going back to the show but they do a lot a lot of this is related to what they they did during that show so Robert Oberst did one uh where I can't remember the name of the strongman he did unfortunately right now because my memory isn't the best sometimes, <laughs> but um, he this guy did a piano hold back in the day too, and I believe what he would do is he got down on all fours. Oh, like um, a turtle on its back, kind of. Thing? Yeah, and he would support. They, that's when you get into your frame. Okay. And then they would put the platform on top of him while he's on his all, all when he's wow. in his position on all fours. Okay. So, and then of course they were like, we're not going to do that. <laughs> All these guys are huge and not very, not flexible. Not like, flexible. like you would have to be, um, Brian Shaw's like almost six, nine over 400 pounds, you know, all, all these guys are huge. huge. So they ended up doing, uh, they did a, uh, what they did at a piano run. <laughs> they strapped a piano to their backs oh and they ran, gosh. they ran it down the street. So, Holy um, it's still a great feat of strength right there. Uh, like, oh my gosh. Well, and Clevio, you know, with his acrobatic, he was probably pretty flexible. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, the acrobats, what we just learned with vaudeville. Yeah. I mean, a lot of this is gymnastics. Exactly. So he was probably very flexible. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see how he... I wish I could find a picture of how he was holding that piano with a musician. Yeah. And I bet you, you know the musician was playing the piano. Like, oh, yeah. that's got to be part of the act. <laughs> yeah. They probably had, once again, tried to find the skinniest guy that could play the piano. <laughs> so. Yeah, like, it's always the little, like, the guy, the jockeys are always, like, really small guys. It's probably yeah. probably like I mean, they, they ain't got no Fat Albert up there, man. <laughs> no, they don't. Oh, hey. <laughs> no, they don't have that. They probably got like a twelve-year-old kid and like put a beard on him and be like, play the piano. <laughs> yeah. They didn't have child labor laws like we do back. Then. No, and they didn't pay him either. They didn't pay him either. They gave him a bag of peanuts and called it a day. Yeah. <laughs> um. And so some of the other things he would do is he would do a handstand himself. So he's doing the handstand with a two hundred and five-pound barbell tied around his neck with a chain. So this. Like, this is just hanging off of his neck while he's doing a handstand. <laughs> I just, yeah, all I can think of is migraine. Like, that would just give me a migraine. <laughs> kind of hard to picture. It is. Um, the barbells, barbells are huge, but I don't know. Mm. You know, after this, now now that I, I see this, I'm, I'm going to have to look that up. Because handstand with a 205-pound barbell? And it was tied around his neck with a chain okay i now i'm starting to see what they're saying was going on that'd be really odd almost uh really not very safe <laughs> <No>. sounds, like, <laughs> not at all. like you want a jacked up neck then exactly. do that exactly you know? i mean because so. one little thing and oh i don't i can't even imagine but during this act he would also do things like bend nails rib phone books and basically just lift crazy amount of weights and um, 
Clevio, during this time, he told a magazine called Clint's Bill. I don't <laughs> know what it was, but maybe a healthy like weightlifting magazine back in the day. That he was the only man in the world who could hold 500 pounds between his teeth while doing a handstand. So if we thought the neck thing was crazy, this is just out of this world to me. I mean, how do you hold 500 pounds between your, your teeth and do a handstand without yeah. your teeth falling out? And that's what's really cool is, uh, I mean, I mean, a lot of this, especially back then, is, is all getting the crowds excited. Yes. You know, I would doubt that it was, I mean, I'm not trying to take anything away from him, but that's just the time yes. that they were in. Mm -hmm. You know, they were trying to make money, make a living, oh, too. Oh, for sure. Um, so, I mean, maybe it's possible, but... Uh, you know, yeah. a lot of times during that show where, where the modern strong men were doing these reenactments, and they would kindly say, this was probably not likely, but so, <laughs> yes. you know, we're just kind of going to throw that out there, Yeah. you know, because the, the guys nowadays are stronger. Oh, absolutely. Okay. And if they can't do it. For absolute strength. Now, if you're talking pound for pound, that's a whole different discussion. Definitely. But, and especially, um, I mean, come on. You take Brian Shaw, who's 6'9", like, at one point he was, like, 440 pounds versus somebody who's 5'8". Yeah. And, and 190. Yeah. I mean, that's just called basic biology and physiology there, too, you know? Exactly. Well, like you were saying, you know, these circuses, vaudeville acts, they're putting on a show, and they want... It's like the newspapers back in the day. They would slap the craziest headline on, you know, an article... I, well, I mean, I guess they still kind of do that today, but just to bring that reader in. And it's kind of the same thing. Like, come watch Clevio hold 500 pounds in his mouth while doing a hand, headstand. And even handstand. if it was half that amount, that's exactly. still... Exactly. Honestly, I'd be like 20 pounds for me. I'm like, <laughs> we're going to have dentures after this, you know? I know, but that's what's so, like, what happened with the, your teeth? And but so, once again, it's so odd. Like, I don't even know how to picture that. And so... That's part of the thing, too, is you don't understand. Exactly. Like, well, and it could have just been fake weight. I mean, yeah, it and I'm, been fake I'm not weight. saying that all of his lifts were fake weight, but between the teeth, I mean, you you could have some major damage there very easily. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I think the weight was just exaggerated. Mm -hmm. I think he was doing real weight. Yeah. But it was just exaggerated. Yes, exactly. So. They're like, did we say five hundred? We met five. Yeah. <laughs> Our bad. <laughs> and so, um, as Clevio became more popular, he started touring all over the United States and Mexico with different acts. Uh, but when World War I broke out, Clevio, he did serve in the army, and he was stationed at Camp Gordon. And I meant to look up where Camp Gordon was. I'm guessing, I'm guessing New York. Um, or maybe back east. I don't know. Let's see. Camp Gordon. Oh, it's in Georgia. And so he served in, like I said, he served in the army. And during this time, he he kind of remained, had the was a performer in the military. And he would use a 135-pound soldier instead of a rifle to perform exercises from the manual of arms. <laughs> so basically, yeah. he would just twirl a grown man around instead of a rifle. Yeah, that's interesting because, you know, we did that when I was in the Marines. Yeah. And uh, there's there's a team for the Marines called the Silent Drill Team, and they are really good. With, like, I mean, the rifle they do, work? Oh, yeah, it's yeah. amazing. And, and if you guys haven't seen that, just look it up. So look at the Marine Silent Drill Team. Yeah. So if this guy's even doing basic moves with a man, that's... That's amazing. That is amazing. Yeah, because if that was me, that person would be getting dropped right on their <laughs> noggin. Exactly. <laughs> well, whoops. <laughs> they I can barely like, Butterfingers. <laughs> Butterfingers, I know. I can barely walk down the hall with a cup of coffee without yeah. spilling it all over. So that tells me, too, he had a hell of a grip. You know what? That's a good point. Really good grip strength. Really good grip. Yeah. yeah. He probably... Yeah, because we were able to hold on to a grown man. I mean, 135 pounds is small, but still, like... And, and moving them into the different... The way you're twirling a rifle yeah. and getting it... To, if he's doing that with a man, that's 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 impressive. I wonder if this soldier was wearing his helmet. I would be worried, like... Yeah. <laughs> skid my head on the ground and get road rash on your head. And... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it's just... 
it's pretty impressive. And I guess it would draw like really big crowds and, you know, a good morale booster. Yeah. For sure. Especially, you know, World War One. I. I mean, it's crazy. So. I mean, that's amazing. He's a World War One vet too. I know. Jeez Louise. He has, he, he lived quite the life. He really did. Uh, did you happen to find any research? Like, was he de- was he deployed? Was he in combat and like trench warfare and stuff? You know, I found some of his veteran records on ancestry, but I couldn't tell if he was ever deployed or not. Gotcha. Um, and so I, I'm kind of leaning that he stayed in the states. Okay. Um, and so I couldn't find anything. And usually, you can find, um, you know, like Jerry Carabetta, who. I will later on do an episode. He was a long, long distant cousin of mine back in the day. I found his records online and it's pretty easy to tell, like transferred to France, spent, you know, so many times time, so much time in France and I couldn't find anything like that with him. So, wow. But maybe he did and it's just not out there. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, it just reminds me of that book, All Quiet on the Western Front. Oh yeah. Just, man. Anyways, that, 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 that was warfare. a heck of a, oh, it was brutal. Oh, it was so Absolutely insane. brutal. Yeah. Was that um, when mustard gas was big too, World War yeah. One? Yeah, they were yeah. using mustard gas. Uh, yeah. That was very damaging, like neurologically, right? Oh, I mean, yeah, that mustard gas would, would, would neurologically, and then it caused a lot of trouble with the lungs mm, and yeah, for the rest of their lives too, yeah. you know, and just permanent damage. So, man, just again, different world. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's crazy. Um, but while he was at Camp Gordon, he actually had a little bit of time where he sparred with Mike Gibbons, who was a professional boxer. And he also trained Jack Dempsey so that Dempsey could get ready for a prize fight. Nice. How cool is that? I'd like to find out what fight that was and if he won it. I know. Wouldn't that be cool? I bet he did because Jack Dempsey was the man. He didn't, yeah. he didn't lose that many fights. He didn't. So. I didn't know, I, did, I knew Jack Dempsey, I knew that name. Uh, I didn't know Mike Gibbons, I had to look that one up, but um, yeah, he was he was sparred with him and trained Dempsey, so. Yeah, that's sweet. Man. I know, it's pretty cool. And so after World War I, his vaudeville performances were not as popular as they used to be, and honestly, I think vaudeville was just kind of dying out around this time. Um, so Clevio, he switched careers again. He just never gave up. And this was when he really started becoming a wrestler and honestly a professional wrestler. Yeah. So. Yeah. You know, uh, my family has a little bit of a rich history with that. Oh, definitely. So not, not of recent, um, but back in the thirties, the forties and the, even the fifties, um, my family, the Dettons mm-hmm. were known as professional wrestlers. Yep. And uh, so the most notable was my great uncle Dean, who was the world wrestling champion in 1936. Yep. Yeah, and then he ended up losing it later to uh, Bronco Nagurski. Okay. Ended up taking the title away from him. Yeah. But yeah, I, my uncles were were big boys. They were. I only got to meet a couple of them when I was young, you know, because yeah. a lot of them had passed away. But I met Gene. Uh, Which he, was Dean's brother. His younger brother. Yep. And uh, he was a vacuum salesman. <laughs> and from time to time, out of Texas. Yeah. And out of Amarillo, Texas. <laughs> and he would drive around in a van and he'd sell vacuums. I, I even remember that as a kid. Like people coming to the, you know, in yeah. the late 80s, early 90s, coming to the door to sell vacuums. Is he the one that broke your dad's um, scale? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He came that we So, uh, you know, we grew up with my 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 grandma yeah my grandma was basically like my mom yeah you know because my, my parents had to separate yeah so um my dad and me and my two brothers lived with my grandma well uncle gene would come and visit yeah and he oh and he came and yeah he's like oh i need to see how heavy i am <laughs> he popped on that scale and it went all the way to the ground <laughs> And this, you know, it wasn't like a fancy scale nowadays with the digital. It was just a regular manual scale with a spring. Yeah. But after he had stepped on it, it, it wasn't the same anymore. <laughs> so, but so he was funny. well over 300 pounds. Oh, you my know. gosh. But, uh, and all those guys were over six feet, you yeah. know. So just big boys. Yep. That's but, really cool. Yeah, really, really. I grew up with a lot of colorful stories. Oh, for sure. Surrounding around. So Dean... Dory wrestled, Gene wrestled. Well, and all the boys were, 
they grew up on a ranch. Idaho, right? Yeah, out yeah. in Idaho. Small house. Oh, yeah. Uh, you, and Stephanie is actually way better with keeping up on family history and genealogy than mm-hmm. I am. She can tell you more with how, how many siblings were there? Uh, there was 12. 12 of them. Yes. In this little wooden shack. And I mean, when he says shack, he's not lying. It was a little bit bigger than a garage, maybe. Yeah. Or if not the, just the size of a garage, but two stories. And then, so it's just crazy. Like, we take so many things for granted. We're like, oh, I got enough space. And it's yeah. like me and Stephanie and our dogs. And we're in like a little over a 1300 square. <laughs> I ain't got enough space. I know. We need more room. And then yeah. you think about their life growing up. Yeah. They had like no air conditioning. No. Nope. Oh, man. 12 kids, two adults, living on a farm in Idaho in the summers. Oh, my gosh. Lord. It's crazy. Yeah. But anyways, I, I didn't, I don't mean to digress, but oh, yeah. Oh, no, that's fine. I'm glad you talked about that. That's cool he got into wrestling. Um, And Dean Denton, and actually, you know what, I'm going to post this because it's kind of cool. Um, He was actually compared to Hercules. Remember that photo? The modern Hercules. The modern Hercules. I still have the photo and they compare his measurements to... To what they thought Hercules right. measurements were. Yep. So that's kind of a cool connection. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, to Clevio. So yeah, because uh, yeah, Dean was like six two. Yeah, he was huge. Um, you know this. So guys, you gotta keep in mind this is back in the '30s too. Yeah. Okay. These these guys. They were farm boys. They were. This is this is farm boy strength, and just like Clevio, mm-hmm. you know what I mean. This is way before the time of PEDs. Performance enhancing drugs. Oh yeah, okay? definitely. People weren't even. This wasn't even in that realm. This is natural. Some somebody who's six <laughs> two and like two thirty, two forty, and ripped back then. That's a big boy. Oh yeah. You know, especially so, to the average man back then. Yeah. You know, and I think overall, even on average, we're just bigger than yeah nineteen thirties, nineteen tens. I mean, <laughs> we're way bigger. Yeah, we're definitely bigger sometimes it's not a lot of good things yeah, it's too. not necessarily a good thing yeah especially here in america yeah. unfortunately yeah and also by the way guys let's change that stigma baby get out there start moving get, yeah. eat healthy you know yep uh we don't we don't want people thinking about americans like that way all the time no definitely yeah because it's like pianos yeah handstands yeah well that's yeah. why we were talking about what clevio was saying earlier exactly his you know? weakness is yeah i can't remember what he said but yeah yeah, it's uh, you know he was basically he be strong. Yeah, and strong means fit. Exactly. You know. Yeah. So, but anyways, you know, you know that's one of my passions. Oh yeah. You know, so I've always, I've been in the fitness my whole life. Yep. And uh, I think it does make a big difference. Uh, I think like Clevio, it runs in your blood. And you know, you look at like Dean Denton and the wrestlers and stuff, and that is true. It, it's in like part of you. And, and Dean Denton married an Italian woman. He did. He did from Utah. Yeah, he did. So I me and Dean had that in common. Yep. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I remember like because my grandpa was a World War II vet. Yeah. This was Dean's. So my my grandpa's name was Melvin, and he was he was a bit younger than Dean. Yeah, your uh, eight grandpa nine was years? one of the younger. I think he was the second to the youngest. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. And so, and my grandpa wasn't one of the, my grandpa was one of the smallest out of the boys. Um, but he was still really strong. And I mean, when we were kids and he would, sometimes he'd babysit us, Uh he'd take us to the park and he'd just have us run laps (laughs) and he'd time us, you know, (laughs) know, or or he'd have us do push ups and stuff like that. See how how fast. And then sometimes he'd come over to my grandma's house, you know, his ex-wife at the time and, um, you know, they still got along okay, but um, he would come out and, or he'd see how fast we could make it around the house and things but like that. Yeah, so. it's definitely in, in your guys' blood, all of yeah. that fitness. And, <laughs> I mean, because, you know, you think of, like, most grandpas babysitting. You don't think of, like, let's go run laps at the park and I'll time you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Reminds me of that Office episode where Pam's um, timing Dwight and... I don't remember who the other was. It Toby? Yeah, it was Toby with the digital thermometer. Yeah, <laughs> she runs the fastest, and then she just gives up and goes in. Yeah. Dwight's like killing himself. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> She's like, "You better hurry." Yeah. <laughs> I love it. That is a good episode. It was. <laughs> All right, so um, his popularity was—he was pretty popular uh, with his, even his wrestling. He toured all over North and South America, 
And he held his own against some of the big time wrestlers of the time. And like we were talking about earlier, he was only 5'8". He, he won a few championships. I don't think he ever won like the national championship, but um, you know, they would always, I saw a lot of articles where he would draw the one article was like, whenever Claudio comes, he draws a different crowd. There's so many Italians here. <laughs> and so, you know, I think him being one of the only Italian wrestlers, they, you know, his community would come out and be like, we got to go see this Italian Hercules. <laughs> yeah, supporting their fellow Italian. Yep. Yeah. And there's actually a video out um, where Clevio is, I guess you could say sparring, like he's practicing wrestling moves with some guy um, just to show, like to teach people how to wrestle. And you can still see that uh, YouTube video. It's kind of cool. Really? Uh huh. Yeah, I'll have to show you. Oh, wow. I would like to take a look at that. Yeah, I watched yeah. it just because, you know, I was just trying to get as much information on Clevio as I could. So... It's That's pretty awesome. Neat. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so Clevio, he even told a reporter with the Buffalo Times that his, you know, his wrestling career was full of flair as well. And he laughs when he remembers back to the time when he, quote, wrestled a 450 pound polar bear while he was in Washington, D.C. And I guess he was offered $50 to wrestle the bear by a promoter at the wrestling match. And Clevio's was like, heck yeah, I will. Let's do this. But the promoter snuck out before he paid Clevio. <laughs> so you know this story's true. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. those promoters were dirty. They're dirty, man. They, they were dirty. Go, oh, yeah. That's, I, I, was, I was like, yeah, I don't know about it. And then as soon as he said the promoter like gave him the shaft, like, yep, that's a true story. That's a true story. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Because you know that promoter was probably like, hey, let's see. You know, we've got Clevio. He used to be this like vaudeville guy. Let's see if he'll wrestle and we'll draw a huge crowd in. And then he probably, he probably like... It was probably taking bets on the side. Like, hey, who thinks Clevio is going to win? Who thinks the Bolivar is going to win? And then he just walked out with all the money. Yeah. (laughs) You know, one thing, though, behind that is uh, wrestling bears is a real thing. And that blows my mind. And uh, they do that in countries. Like, so if you guys want to look at it, um, one of the UFC fighters, Khabib Nurmagomedov. Oh, man. (laughs) Having trouble saying that (laughs) name. That's a hard one. Nurmagomedov. Khabib Nurmagomedov uh, started wrestling bears from a young age. And was is he Russian? Yeah, he's from... Uh, somewhere back there, huh? Somewhere in that area. I um, can't remember where he's from. Dagestan. He's from Dagestan. Okay. And so, um, yeah. but anyways, he's from that area, and these guys really do roll with bears. <laughs> It's insane. It's insane. I know. <laughs> so are they declawed? I mean, no. Holy no, smokes. they're not. De- they're not declawed. They're, <laughs> you know, um, I think what it is is maybe the bears are brought in and maybe somewhat uh, domesticated. Yeah, that's true. A little bit you more can't domest just, just like you can't domest you can't fully domesticate a lion. Okay? Yeah, you can bring them into captivity and. Just like people will take them as pets and then they get eaten. A few, yeah, exactly. A few, or few like years the later, attack people. So I mean, there's some there's interaction with humans. So it's not like it's a bear that just came right out of the True. wild. They're wrestling. It like but, brings their tameness down a few months. Not just. But still, the, even just to go through the motion, because bears are a, on a completely different level. Humans, human strength compared to wild animals is nothing. Oh yeah. You know, so I think it's more to to feel what it's like to go against real power. And so when yeah, they step true. when they step into a ring with a man, not so bad. <laughs> it's not a big deal. Because they know, oh wow, I know what real power feels like. Exactly. So, yeah, that makes sense because then they can it doesn't really feel like it's anything at that point. Yeah. And that's going. just me completely coming up. I don't know. There might be a completely different reason behind but it. But it makes so. sense though. I mean because if you look at like that that guy, I'm not even gonna try to uh, attempt his name but um wrestling i mean that yeah. makes sense because then he goes into the ufc arena and it's not that big of a deal and then and for clevio i mean it was a draw people to the show kind of thing yeah and it was also probably um it makes you focus on your technique more because you can't if you got somebody True. that's that much stronger than you yeah. then you really need technique so that's probably what it's more about probably learning how to to reverse and escape and things like that that's well and I don't know anything about wrestling, but I'm sure, you know, like, if you're wrestling somebody, you could maybe look at them and predict the move that they're going to make based off of, you know, maybe the stance they're in or something. 
You're not going to be able to do that with a bear. You have no idea <laughs> what's well, coming yeah. at you. <laughs> and you have no clue what they're capable of. Exactly. So. Yep. So, uh, we'll talk about a little bit about his personal life here. Because in 1947, he married Leona Swiatek. Uh, she was Polish. Um, and they ended up having three kids together. Dolores, Joseph, and Cora. And they settled, like, their home base was in Buffalo, where his family was. Um, you know, he still traveled around and did his wrestling. But around the 1950s, Clevio started slowing down a little bit in terms of basically the amount he traveled and how many shows he would put on or wrestled. Because in 1950, he's 60 years old. Yeah. And, you know, he just got married three years ago and now has three kids. So yeah, he, he started getting married and having kids at 57? 57 years old. And so she was, I think she was 26 years younger than him. Um, so, I mean, you, like, you think about, he lived a life, a full life <laughs> until 57 and then got married and had children and has a whole, I mean, he doesn't die until he's 84, I believe. So he basically did the opposite of he what did. most people do. Yep. He, he, he lived his life. Yep. Basically till he was 60. Yep. And then said, I ain't got nothing else going for me. Might as well have some kids. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm, I'm completely joking, know, of course. I, I, I actually think that's that's pretty amazing, I think honestly. so, too. Because it's kind of like so. he had... It's just like two lives. I mean, you know, a lot of times people... Like your Uncle Dean, he had married and had the kids during the whole wrestling thing. Um, and so a lot of the times those lives are intermingled. But these are... They're kind of separate. Because after he got married, he kind of stopped traveling around. So... You think that, that, that um, maybe is why he waited... Because coming from an Italian culture and background, family is so important. Yep. So maybe he knew like he had to do his career yeah. because if he had a family, then he'd have to walk away from it. Yeah, and he wasn't you ready know? to walk away from it. I mean, that's just part of the culture. Oh, for sure. No, that's I a mean, really good point. I didn't not think good, of it that way. You're not a good person. You're not a good man if you neglect your family exactly you know, and you don't devote your time family, to your family family's everything to family's him, so. everything exactly no that's a good point i didn't even think <clears> about that that could have been it and because he knew that he just wasn't ready to stop what he was doing yeah so i think that's smart how he if he, that was why it makes sense yeah and so when he was back in buffalo you know living the family life he decided to put his musical talent to work again and he started playing in various nightclubs in the New York area. And he actually had a really rare violin. It was over 250 years old and was valued at $5,000. And so I, today that's about $65,000. And I, I compared it to about 1955 because, you know, if he had it valued in the 50s, I just went right in the middle. So $65,000. And it was 250 years old. I bet it was like a Stradivarius violin. Those things are like so expensive. Are they? Yeah, yeah I have. I just I just idea. learned about a little bit of that when I was in orchestra. Okay, gotcha. But yeah, yeah, my dad was pissed off when I decided to quit. He spent five hundred dollars on mine. Oh my gosh! See, I was like, boy, you can learn how to play that violin. <laughs> Or and viola. For viola. me, it was the viola. Yeah. Yeah. Five hundred dollars seems like a lot of money to me. Yeah. I mean, and this about this thing's valued at five thousand. Yeah, I bet you're not mad. Yeah, he was. <laughs> That's a lot of money. <laughs> um, and so Clevio, he, you know, he would go to New York and play in the nightclubs, but he also would eventually start teaching bodybuilding classes, and he would teach the class five nights a week. He taught them like in the evenings, and so they were more driven towards adults. And not necessarily, I mean, I guess teenagers could have went too, but, um, and he also taught acrobat, acrobat classes at a local adult center. So I think it's cool that, you know, he's technically retired, but then he was passing on that knowledge. So for sure. Yeah. That's amazing. And honestly, the last 20 years or so of Clevio's life was pretty quiet. I think like we talked about earlier, he just enjoyed spending time with family, kids, eventually grandkids. Cause I, I just, I couldn't find a whole lot on him. You know, he just, he was everywhere in the news uh, papers until like 1950. And then it just kind of dwindles down. Um, and so he did end up passing away at the age of 84 on February 20, on February 2nd, 1975. 
And his obituary now was just full of surprises and interesting tidbits about his life. And I mentioned earlier about him working with Teddy Roosevelt. And this was the thing that shocked me the most uh, because I had done all of this research and then I got to his obituary and it says that he, uh, Teddy Roosevelt approached him and asked him to help him help train him and be a bodyguard for him, bodyguard for him. And I had done all this research and I had no idea until I saw that in his obituary. And I still can't find anything on it, but I think, you know, he was the president. Maybe it was kind of done in secret. I have no idea. But how cool is that? Yeah, I mean, when I uh, when you told me about this, I thought it was amazing. Teddy Roosevelt, probably my favorite president, honestly. Yeah, he's one of, cool. No, definitely towards the very top. Oh, definitely. I mean, yeah, he's a the cool bull guy. moose, man. Yep. Come on. <laughs> exactly. Gets shot in the chest. He's got like a speech. That's the story, right? He had a huge, thick speech in his pocket. Somebody yeah. shot him in yep. that speech, and it, it, it did hurt him, but he, <laughs> he finished his speech. He finished his speech. Yeah, he had so. like... Was it a flask or something in his pocket? It was something. I, I was told because he. I was told he had his thick, like his whole speech. Oh, you're it was right. So his thick notebook. the paper. Yes. And so it went. And of course, you know, back then, you know, it's not like the pistols we have now. It was might have been like a cap and ball pistol. Sure. So it might have not been super powerful to begin with. Yeah. But it, it just the whole idea. It's the it's it's really about the mindset. Okay, if you get shot, you're you probably not going to try to finish a speech, no matter <laughs> if it was you know you're just bleeding a little bit or a lot. You know, just the so, mental shock of it is. But he overcame that. Yeah. And I bet you, Clevio, going back again to Clevio's quote about how men and women should be strong and all that kind of stuff, he probably really admired Teddy Roosevelt for an example like that. But also, Teddy Roosevelt, he was kind of sickly his whole life. Uh, he just, I read, I read some of his autobiography about him, but he was, you know, he was always kind of just physically sick and nothing would help him. And so one day he just said, I'm just going to make myself healthier. I'm going to exercise. And I'm going to get really strong. And he did. And he changed his whole life. Like, yeah. he was kind of this sick little child that never really left the house. And then... I mean, he hunted in Wyoming, and he did all of these crazy, amazing things. So I bet Clevio looked at him and almost admired him. Like, hey, yeah, you are, you overcame that. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I wish, it would be really nice to find some more information on this, too. I know. It'd be cool to see um, a picture of the two of them together. Yeah. Yeah, because he saw, Roosevelt saw him perform in 1911, um, and. Which. I mean, come on. Okay, so 1911. What year did World War One start? 1914, I think. So just a few years before World War One started kicking off. Yeah, 1914 to 1918. And when was Teddy Roosevelt? When was he the president? Um, well, he died in 1919. So he was the president from 1901 to 1909. Yeah. So right after his served two terms, he yeah, served two terms, yeah, and so he saw him wrestle in nineteen eleven and was so impressed by him, he was like, "Hey, <laughs> so he, I'm sorry, can, can you say the what was his term? Uh, nineteen oh one to nineteen oh nine. So nineteen oh one to nineteen oh nine. If he saw him in nineteen eleven, so this was after he would after. So he yeah. hit, he was no longer the the sitting president. Mm -mm. He was two but, years out. Um, he was still. Very interested in fitness and stuff. Yeah, exactly. So and he was maybe born that's in 1858. Why, yeah, maybe that's why it didn't receive maybe quite as much. True. It's because he wasn't actually the sitting president anymore. Yeah, exactly. So, and yeah, maybe um, if he was still the sitting president, it would have been... You would have probably for sure seen yeah. documentation or pictures or articles about it. You know what would be interesting is to if, if we could track down what performances he was doing in 1911... Mm -hmm. And if you could track down maybe the hype that was around maybe Roosevelt showing up to one of them, oh. then you might be able to pull that local paper's yeah. archives and actually find an article on it or That's something. That's true. Because so. I'm looking at just whatever. So I do Genealogy Bank and newspapers.com. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll type in like New York historic papers, but I'm at the mercy of whatever's online. Right. So you're right. It could be. I'm sure there's something out there about it. And if you could connect those two, like a performance of 1911 and 
some sort of like, hey, former President Roosevelt's coming to our town in Ohio yeah. <laughs> or whatever to see the circus act or something, you know? That's a good point. Yeah. Because yeah, it would be, oh man, I would just love to see a picture of the two of them together. Oh, they, yeah. I bet they were impressed by each other. I mean, I think Clevio liked how he overcame, you know, his sicknesses and stuff like that. And I think Roosevelt at that point was so into fitness and health that Clevio must have impressed him. Yeah, <laughs> so, for sure. Yeah, because Teddy was uh, quoted saying one time that he swears that exercise is what healed his body. Yeah. And so it's kind of, I mean, they were sort of meant to meet each other, I think. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and not only was he, he a trainer for him, he was also his bodyguard for a short time. And so... Yeah, because you, you got to imagine 1911, so, you know, they say a short time, a year or so. Mm-hmm. I wonder, because in 1911, a couple years, and then you're getting ready for World War World I. One. And so, Teddy Roosevelt died in 1919. Interesting. So, Teddy Roosevelt was towards the end of his life, yeah. really. Well, yeah, because he I was mean, born in 1858, so... Yeah, so <laughs> he's a, he, he pretty... For that time, pretty Even in old. Even 1911. Yeah, pretty old, he and older. he's still interested in fitness and things yeah. like that. So that's, that's awesome. Pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because even in 1911, he was an older guy. Yeah. So, um, another thing that I saw in Clevio's obituary was it said that he was mentioned in Ripley's Believe It or Not three times. And so now the obituary says mention um, and not like put in. So I don't know if he was actually in Ripley's for breaking the records or if they were just mentioning his strength. I think. They focused on him ripping the phone books and bending the nails and stuff like that. So, gotcha. But because uh, I I couldn't find you know usually you can Google something like Ripley's Believe It or Not record and he never popped up. So I think just because he meant they mentioned it, you know, it's probably like hey watch for this guy he might break a record one day he's ripping phone books. Right. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. And his wife Leona she she lived until she was ninety six and she passed away in two thousand twelve which feels so recent to me. But again, she was 26 year, years younger than Clevio. That's crazy. Yeah. So he passed away in the late 70s? 75. And then she passed away in 2012. Yeah, well, it feels so recent. Doesn't seem that long ago. Considering he was yeah. like in vaudeville acts. It's just, you know, crazy Jeez, how the generations can span. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, and that quite an age gap between the two of them, of course. Yeah, yeah definitely. So. Um, and I found a really cool picture of Clevio in his older life and he's holding one of his grandkids like high in the air. So he's got his grandkids feet in his hands and he's got his hands just straight up above his head and the kid's just standing up and he's holding him. And I mean, he's gotta be, you showed me that picture. It's a cool picture and I'll post it on the Instagram. I mean, he's gotta be, gosh, in his late seventies, if not eighties at that point. I mean, the kid's small. He's not like a 12 year old or anything. He's probably like three. Yeah, but still, (laughs) still, like... I wouldn't do that with a kid. No. Because I, more than likely, they wouldn't stay up there for very Again, long. Kids are squirmy. So, <laughs> They're yeah. squirmy little guys. So, uh, yeah, no, that's awesome. Yeah, so, yeah, but that's that's about it for Mr. Clevio Mosmo. <laughs> yeah, so, man, yeah. so interesting. Like, uh, I think this guy needs to get uh, some type of mention. I do, too. Somewhere, you know, maybe we'll... we'll shoot them an email. We'll shoot them an email yeah. saying, you know, here's a link to our podcast, your, your podcast. But if, if even if they don't listen to the podcast, they should yeah. at least just look at, look at this guy. Because I think, I've heard that they're doing another season of The Strongest Man in History. That'd be and, cool. Because he did some really cool things, like with the piano and lifting eight men. They could reenact some of that stuff, or at least attempt to. I mean, this guy's story is just, it's completely amazing. I mean... Yeah. The, the not only the feats of strength that he's doing, the guy also was a well accomplished musician, and yes. he put that into his his actual strongman acts. Yep, I think that's unique in itself. I do I'm too. sorry, we'll, we're gonna have to check that. I'm gonna have to look at it too. But um, and he just wasn't playing like Yankee Doodle Dandy or something <laughs> like that. The guy's playing Mendelssohn's freaking concerto in E minor. I mean, these are like things that professional violinists play. Yeah. So. He is entertaining the crowd with music, and then he's he's entertaining them with his mind and his body. And his body, I know. Actually, it's funny that you said that. There's a really cool photo that I found, and again, I'll post it on Instagram. But it has him, like, in a suit, and he's playing the violin. So he's, you know, like, at a concert. And then 
it reminds me of those old eighties photos where like one face is fading in and like all this kind of weird stuff. But, and then in like the background, it has him like flexing at his show. And so it's kind of like showing the two worlds and like how diverse of a person he was. Cause I mean, like you said, he could lift all this stuff and then play the violin and train Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, my goodness. Yeah, and he, not to mention he was a world war one vet. World war one vet. You know, um, he took care of his family when he was younger, and then... Yeah. You know. Started started his family when he was basically 60? Come on. <laughs> exactly, yep. It takes a lot of strength to do that. <laughs> oh my gosh, I know. Our nephews <laughs> come over and we're like, ugh. <laughs> it's so tiring. <laughs> I know. Um, and so I'll have to have you back um, and do another strongman, because when I was researching Clavio... I had heard of Charles Atlas, but I had no idea Charles Atlas was was Italian. Yeah, and uh, so I've I've known that for a while, and it's only because, you know, I've been into this. You're in this, yeah. You know, uh, mainly, so that that goes into the bodybuilding realm of things. Yeah. And so I, I kind of had a unique experience because it just so happened at my high school, we had, a, you know, a multiple time Mr. Colorado, uh, oh, yeah. Coach Rod McDonald mm -hmm. uh, is our weightlifting coach. But he put together a high school bodybuilding team, which he ran for years. Yeah. And I, you know, never heard anybody else having a high school bodybuilding team. Oh, no, me either. So I think that was... Especially in the early, late 90s, early 2000s. Exactly. Yeah. So um, I got brought into this whole thing with bodybuilding as part of schooling. Yeah. In when I went into weightlifting, I mean, Coach Mack had, had all kinds of posters of... Uh, Arnold and yeah. the old school bodybuilders up around the gym. That's I watched cool. Pumping Iron, yeah. you know, and uh, that has a lot of Lou Ferrigno in it too. Yeah, it has mm -hmm. Lou Ferrigno, and so you got to imagine a teenage boy uh, having a mentor. Uh, you know, it, it can be very empowering, especially I'd say for people, uh, kids that are looking for some type of outlet. Yeah, you know. Um, because but maybe like normal quote quote unquote normal sports like football baseball those kind of things exactly not just for, but it's just not for them but that's a nice a different outlet yeah yeah exactly mm -hmm. yeah. so yeah so anyways uh i didn't want to get off on too much of a tangent there but yeah it's charles atlas was kind of a role model back in the day to young boys nice that's you know cool. the whole the whole and we can get into this on the next one but yeah the, that that old school thing where they have the magazines with the skinny wimp on the beach. Yes. And then the guy, you know what I mean? So that yeah. was that was Charles Atlas, and he was putting out some rudimentary programs and nutrition in magazines back then, trying to get people into fitness and stuff like That's that. That's so. really cool. Yeah, like I said, I'd always heard of him, but I never knew. I ran across this. Um, it was actually a college professor. She wrote the paper talking about um, basically like – the Italian influence on um, the weightlifting strength, the strength world kind of thing. Uh, and so I was diving into it for Clevio and she has like two sentences about Clevio and she's like, but now we're going to leave Clevio behind and talk about Charles Atlas. And I was like, wait, what? He's Italian. I had no idea. So you just reminded cool. me of something though. Like, and I know you mentioned it shortly, but like Clevio came from what was considered in Italy big people sure so they you were saying they were called the three giants, the three giants. right his dad and his two brothers were called the three giants. so yeah so his his father and his two uncles yeah so he came from from big stock yeah so and then they had uh alluded to the fact they were related to some roman gladiators yeah. and things like that which i i love i love that type oh, of, whether know. it's true or not i just love that type of it's a cool it's tie a cool in, image you know? yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> running around with like a shield and yeah. <laughs> yeah like leonidas <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep <laughs> um yeah so we'll definitely i'll i'll dive into charles atlas and we'll we'll do an episode on him yeah i look forward to it oh, that'll be God. awesome well, thank you for recording with me today of course boo boo yeah all right well i hope you enjoyed listening to the story of clevio massimo and i hope you come back to listen to more stories about italian americans see you next time see you later